shopping, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and welcome to the Ilsoy Advisor webinar on Improved Seed Treatment Stewardship Through Innovation, brought to you by the Illinois Soybean Checkoff. My name is Jill Seiler and I will be moderating the webinar today. A few housekeeping items to start with. If you included your CCA number when you registered for this webinar and you stay with us for the entire presentation, your number will automatically be submitted for one CEU in pest management. If you are listening to a recording of this webinar, you will need to go to the Certified Crop Advisor website, log into your account, and apply for a self-study credit. You can ask questions during the webinar by submitting your question using the chat feature in the dashboard on the right side of the screen. There will be time for question and answers at the end of the presentation. Please keep your questions brief and only to one point. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Nick Tinsley. Nick is a seed growth technical representative with Bayer and coordinates the evaluation, development, and demonstration of Bayer seed growth com compounds and products in Illinois, Wisconsin, and Missouri. He earned his master's and doctorate degrees in crop science from the University of Illinois, focusing his studies on the ecology and management of economic insect pests of corn, soybeans, and alfalfa. I'll hand it over to you now, Nick. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks for that introduction. And, and of course, thank you for the invitation to uh, uh, talk this morning. Um, so can you hear me okay then? Yep, we're hearing you fine. Okay, excellent. So happy to be here and happy to see so many people sign up uh, for a presentation that is essentially about stewardship. I think that says a lot about the growers of this state and um, those attending that we really uh, care about uh, producing crops in, in a way that's sustainable and in line with, um, you know, a, a changing marketplace. So I think that's very good. Uh, so uh, as was mentioned earlier, I am an entomologist, um, and some of our talk today will touch a little bit on bees. That's why I kind of got this uh, picture of this uh, bee up here uh, kind of working away. I know Seems like seeing bees seems like a long time from now as we kind of sit in the dead of winter and there's about a, a eight inches of snow on the ground, but we can uh, all put on our imagine caps. Um, it's unavoidable to really have this conversation around stewardship without at least talking about bees. Um, but I am not a bee expert. So in the world of entomology, bees are kind of their own little sub uh, category and, and people uh, take them very seriously and know, know much more than I do. Uh, but we do need to touch on them a little bit uh, in order to be able to have this discussion. Um, so the title of my talk here, Improved Seed Treatment Stewardship Through Innovation. Uh, I think it's uh, maybe helpful to kind of go through some definitions just so that we get on the same page as far as what we're talking about. So when we say stewardship, uh, you know, this is kind of one of these words like sustainability that kind of has a broad uh, definition here. And so this is from, you know, Webster's Dictionary. And the part of this definition that I want to kind of uh, point you to is this second one here. So uh, obviously the conducting, supervising, or managing of something, but more importantly, especially the careful and responsible management of something that is entrusted to one's care. So the reason I think that is so important for us to realize is that, you know, even though we're involved in agriculture and many of us have been, you know, applying pesticides for a, a number of years and working in that space, the use of pesticides in agriculture, it, it's not an inherent right. Um, you know, we uh, basically operate uh, with a uh, kind of a license given to us from the public at large. And so it's important for us to recognize that we need, really do need to focus on using these products in a way that is safe and aligns with, you know, uh, objectives of ecology and sustainability um, you know, especially in, in a marketplace where we have consumers with changing demands and uh, a more sophisticated understanding of, of, of kind of what's going on in their food and food supply systems. Um, and, in, and also an increasingly urban population where um, many more individuals are not as connected to the farm as have been in decades past. And so I think that's important for us to kind of all recognize. Um, the second part of that definition I kind of wanted to uh, 
uh, touch on is innovation. So innovation is kind of a buzzword right now. It, you really can't even pick up an agricultural magazine without seeing something uh, about innovation or how to be more innovative and things like this. And, and I think really the definition that I'm kind of uh, hitting on here is just, just something new, a new method, a new idea. Um, and this is something that agricultural companies um, and researchers, you know, even in academia uh, and government are, are doing all the time. We're innovating to bring new solutions to the marketplace so that growers can have um, better options, more efficient options, and really it's just about uh, bringing new things. From the side of Bayer, of course, as a uh, technology provider, we're really focused on the technological aspect of bringing uh, new products to the marketplace. And this doesn't just mean a new um, trait or something like that. It can mean a new um, polymer or dust control agent or a new piece of equipment. And that's kind of what we're going to focus on uh, here today is, is just what is, what is new out there in terms of um, helping you know, increase sustainability and also increase stewardship. So um, real quick, I just want to talk a little bit about um, some of Bayer's efforts surrounding stewardship. So uh, as a company, we are heavily committed uh, to making sure that our products are used in a way that is, uh, you know, on label and um, uh, in line with sustainability efforts. So one of the, there's a number of different ways that we do that. One is that we invest in having technical support individuals in the field who are working with customers and making stewardship recommendations. So these would be individuals like myself who, um, you know, consult with folks when they have questions as well as individuals that are associated with our equipment um, and equipment manufacturing. Um, we have a large um, seed growth equipment uh, facility in Minnesota where we uh, produce treaters and, and things like that. And so, um, you know, we are able to, you know, monitor what's being used, making sure that right rates are going on. We don't want to over treat or under treat seed. Um, we can also make sure that you know, these products are being used uh, with the correct polymers and things like that. Um, so really it's, it's surrounding making sure that the products that we're producing and providing are being used in, in a very sustainable way. In a more general sense, you know, we work with all different kinds of entities to make sure um, that, you know, we're doing things in a sustainable way. So one of those is Crop Life America. We work very heavily with them um, and other industry stakeholders. So other companies, you know, this is an, this sustainability issue is one where um, these companies tend to come together uh, to really, you know, provide the best face forward. So uh, companies like Syngenta, BSF, um, you know, really working together to make sure that, you know, these technologies are used in a way that is in line with, um, you know, what we're trying to do. You know, we're, we're constantly developing technical support and educational materials. Uh, surrounding stewardship, specifically with seed treatment products. Uh, Bayer has been doing seed treatments for a long time and is an industry leader in this effort. And so uh, where seed treatments are involved, Bayer tends to have a large presence in that. Um, and then, of course, we've started the, beer, the Bayer Bee Care Center. Uh, so this is a, a uh, not necessarily just a, a facility, but it involves a number of personnel that are associated with um, Bears efforts surrounding both research and education um, on bee health and other pollinator types of issues. So again, uh, just Bear has a, a very strong focus on stewardship, and I hope to kind of demonstrate that with some of these uh, products. So before we kind of get into some of the products that are out there, um, you know, for this uh, stewardship of seed treatments, I think it's probably helpful to talk a little bit about why we're having um, this conversation. So um, it's no surprise that, um, that I'm going to talk about bees here. So, so the honeybee or Apis mellifera is a, uh, a managed uh, species. Um, of course, it's important uh, for pollination of all different kinds of crops, um, not just in the United States, but abroad. This is an insect that has a, a cosmopolitan distribution. Um, and, and really, there are a number of um, threats that this insect can face, okay? Um, and it's, it is important to recognize that pesticides are a potential threat to honeybees. 
um, you know, they're an insect. So anytime a honeybee is potentially exposed to a high enough dose of some pesticide, uh, especially insecticides, there's the potential for an adverse effect on those honeybees. But pesticides often get kind of uh, pigeonholed as the only problem that bees uh, are, are facing. And this is especially true perhaps in like a, a popular media outlet. Not, not everyone uh, who's working on this uh, issue with bees, uh, you know, is that um, uh, narrow-sighted. We all kind of recognize that there are a number of other factors that affect bees as well. So for example, uh, you know, as I mentioned, these are managed species. So beekeeping practices play a large role in how healthy uh, honeybee colonies can be. Um, you know, these are insects that are um, kind of transported around the country on specific routes to um, uh, pollinate different crops during different times of the year in the growing season. And so there is some stress put on them from just the, the movement around and these types of things. Uh, they also face a number of diseases, viruses, as well as uh, parasites. And one in particular that is um, particularly uh, hazardous to bee health would be the varroa mite. And this is a, uh, an exotic pest that was uh, introduced into the United States uh, sometime in the mid 1980s, uh, if my memory serves me correct. And so that had an impact on, on bees and, and we're still dealing with that uh, today. And that has to be managed. Uh, one that we don't think about a lot is nutrition. So, uh, you know, honeybees potentially sometimes exist in landscapes that are very um, homogenous or, you know, filled with one or two species of crops. And they may or may not be, you know, pollinating at, 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 a time, at the right time that leads to potentially, uh, you know, not very diverse sources of pollen. Um, also, you know, the way that we potentially manage weeds and, and sides of fields and things like that can have an effect on what types of wild um, pollen is available, not just for honeybees, but for other pollinators, native bees, ground dwelling bees as well. And so these are all, these are all playing a role. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize that, you know, the story of honeybee numbers, at least in the United States, is not as bleak as what one would think um, just from kind of a casual read of maybe popular media, um, you know, uh, news articles. So, one of the things to recognize, so I got four graphs here, and we'll start in the top left. So one of the things to recognize is that, um, you know, beekeeping really kind of boomed in the United States following World War II. It was uh, promoted as a hobby among veterans who were coming back from war. And so we had a, a real surge in the number of um, honeybee colonies that were in the United States, uh, you know, following World War II. Since then, we have had a decline in the number of honeybee colonies uh, that are managed in the United States. And these would be the numbers of colonies in millions, okay? Um, this is, as I mentioned before, this is a managed species. And so in some respect, looking at strict honeybee numbers isn't necessarily a great indicator of maybe bee health, as much as it might be an indicator of the demand for honeybees in terms of uh, pollination of crops. And so, so keep that in mind. One of the things, you know, and, and so when we talk about bee health and pesticides, one of the things we commonly talk about are neonicotinoid insecticides. And so it's important to recognize that neonicotinoids were kind of introduced here sometime in the mid 1990s and really took off in, you know, early 2000s through today. And so really we're focusing in terms of um, insecticides from a seed treatment and affecting honeybees. We're really focused on this kind of period after the year 2000 or so. And if you kind of zoom in on this and look over to, to kind of what we've seen, number of U.S. colonies, a million, um, from 2005, let's say, to 2015, what we see is, you know, there's some variability year to year. Sometimes they're up, sometimes they're down. And again, they're a managed species, so this happens. Uh, but generally, the trend is that we've got increasing numbers of honeybee colonies in the United States, which is good to see. Might not pick that up if you were to just kind of read a news report that says, oh, bees are... Bees are dying off at, at rates that are, are you know, uh, unsustainable. Um, but at least this gives us some positive trend that we can look to. Um, colony collapse disorder, which is a very specific um, type of situation that can affect a beehive. And this is not necessarily like a bee kill event where you see a bunch of dead bees surrounding a hive. Colony collapse disorder is where you've got an otherwise healthy colony and for whatever reason, the bees kind of disappear. And I, I believe that this kind of reached ahead 
um, as far as you know, observations of colony collapse somewhere around 2008. Um, as I recall, I was a graduate student and I remember at the ESA or entomology meeting, we were talking a lot about colony collapse around this time. And so um, that's probably what's explaining numbers being down here. Um, since then, we really haven't had a, a lot of, of strict colony collapse. And so um, really it's been more about maintaining um, kind of overwintering uh, colonies of bees. Generally speaking, on the world stage, uh, really there are more beehives now than at any point in time. You know, in the, in the if you look at the 2011 numbers, you can see that there are more bees now than at any point in time in the last 50 years or so. So that's also encouraging. Um, one of the things that we really, I think, tend to cue in on are overwintering losses of honeybee colonies because that's that's important. What we want are healthy colonies going into the winter um, so that they can survive through to the spring. And, and we do see, you know, this number fluctuate quite a bit. Generally, the trend is down, um, depending on the environment um, and how healthy those colonies are going in. Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down, uh, but generally these are good numbers. I can't recall offhand what a sustainable number is. I wanna say um, Beekeeper Association put that at somewhere between 20, 25%. That might be a little high. Uh, they might wanna see lower, but anyway. Um, generally speaking, some of the trends surrounding bees are actually quite positive, at least in terms of the evidence that I uh, see. Not to say that there aren't challenges out there and that we need to constantly be vigilant uh, with our stewardship efforts. Okay, that's the bee talk. Um, I want to quickly get in now. We all kind of know, I think, what seed treatments are, okay? Um, and I'm, I'm fairly young, so I kind of uh, entered graduate school in 2005, and, and um, seed treatments were already um, you know, widely used by then. So I, it's important for me, at least for all of us, to have some understanding of the history of what these seed treatments are. So prior to the 1980s, there were seed treatments out there. Um, they were pretty rudimentary. Um, sometimes the application the equipment wasn't all that um, sophisticated, but the real focus prior to the 1980s is really just surrounding seed borne um, type of infection. So these would be fungal pathogens that, you know, maybe you've got Phomopsis seed decay, uh, in soybean uh, this year, and you're concerned about having a reduced germination uh, and seed rot next year, you would apply something like a seed borne, uh, you know, sanitation type fungicide. And that was good. That helped increase, um, you know, uh, efficiency surrounding uh, seed and, and, and planting of uh, crops. But then following in the 1980s, we started to gain a focus on some of the soil borne types of pathogens. So not just protecting the seed um, and having it germinate, but protecting that, um, that little uh, seedling as it's germinating, uh, you know, as it starts to grow. Um, and, the, and the real focus here again was on diseases, um, you know, things like uh, perhaps a, a Pythium or and Phytophthora, which we'll talk about here on the next slide, uh, but also on insects that could potentially uh, feed on those seeds uh, as they uh, are, are germinating. So these would be things like, you know, wire worms, seed corn maggot, um, you know, any of these types of insects that are feeding in the soil. Um, and then there was, you know, some developments in the, in the 1990s through kind of the early 2000s, mid 2000s, where we started to see a shift in uh, focus on providing, you know, plant protection into the early growing season. So, uh, active ingredients that maybe stayed around a little longer, um, either in the root zone, um, you know, and helping provide protection against some of these other pathogens or above ground. So, you know, systemic insecticides like the neonicotinoids, and these would be gaucho, poncho, cruiser, these things that can move in the plant and provide some protection above ground against things that um, could potentially be feeding there, um, you know, uh, aphids or bean leaf beetles, uh, anything that, that's really affecting the above ground tissues. And so that was a huge advancement. Um, and then today, um, and I left something off here, but, but today there's a real focus on application technology. Okay, so making sure that we're providing uh, the right amount of active ingredient, um, you know, not over treating, not under treating, but just right. Um, doing it in a way that means that those active ingredients are staying on the seed and not drifting uh, due to abrasion or other things like that. So that's a real focus now. Another focus that I, that I probably should have added to this is we are, we are increasingly focused on things like um, nematodes, uh, nematicides, as well as biologics. And I'll, I'll touch on that uh, here in, in just a moment. So um, why use a seed treatment um, from a sustainability standpoint? Well, I think 
it's important to recognize uh, what kind of an advancement, um, you know, seed treatments have been o over things like broadcast application. Now, a seed treatment can't replace all applications. And I apologize, we've got corn plants here. I know this is a soybean association event, but I'm guessing there are a number of you out there that interact with corn as well. So hopefully you'll forgive me. Um, so it, it's really easy to see that, that a seed treatment, um, you're really treating much less of the area of a field. Uh, than you would be from using something like a broadcast application where you're spraying over the top or a banded application where you're applying in row or, uh, you know, immediately over the, the growing seedlings. Uh, seed treatment, you're, you're treating less than 1% of the amount of uh, area of that acre uh, compared to these other methods. And so that represents a, a huge benefit. Um, from, a, from a standpoint of an insecticide, uh, like a neonicotinoid, these things do move in the plant. Um, one of the other benefits of a neonicotinoid is that they have an extremely favorable mammalian toxicity profile. So compared to other active ingredients like organophosphates and pyrethroids, neonicotinoids um, are uh, much safer for humans to handle um, and work with. You know, obviously p proper PPE needs to be used anytime you're handling pesticides, but the risk of, of you know, an, an acute type of uh, reaction is much lower than those other uh, actives and classes. So what, what exactly is on a seed treatment? Um, so when one of my biggest pet peeves, and I work in seed treatments, so it's um, you know kind of one of these things I have to watch out for, but one of my biggest pet peeves is when people talk about, well, it's either treated or not treated, and I don't care what's on the seed. Seed treatments are incredibly complex, and they can be very sophisticated or very uh, simple, depending on the goal. And again, we've got a corn seed here, uh, so bear with me, but in this diagram here, you see that we've got this seed course. That's where that little kernel is. You know, uh, you could plant that and it would uh, potentially germinate if it wasn't under any kind of insect or disease pressure. Uh, but really, it's about protecting against uh, a number of different risks that are out there. So starting down here with these things in the red, this is typically what is uh, considered part of the, I don't know, the active ingredients of a seed treatment. So uh, we tend to think of our, our base level of protection as a fungicide. Okay, and even that is more complex than what you might think because we have fungicides that protect against uh, true fungi, so things like fusarium, uh, rhizoctonia, things like that. Some of those fungicides can be very broad spectrum, protect against a lot of different fungi. Some of them can be very narrow, protecting against just uh, a single genus or species of fungus. Okay, so an example of that might be something like um, you know, uh, prothiaconazole might be more broad spectrum, whereas something like fluopyram, which is, you know, what's in Olivo is going to be very narrow spectrum on, uh, on a specific fungus. Um, and then we also have in that category uh, what are called oomycetes. So things like Pythium and Phytophthora, these things aren't actually true fungi. They're called water molds, and they take a totally different type of fungicide, if you will, uh, to control them. So that fungicide really can be broken down into two different categories. Uh, kind of the next level of protection you'll often see is an insecticide. So in soybeans, we're typically seeing things like um, the neonix, so uh, poncho or poncho vitivo, I mean, and as well as gaucho and cruiser. And so um, these are products that have been around uh, for some years now. And um, it's important to recognize that we continue to, we as an industry, all, all companies are continuing to look for and provide newer insecticide modes of action. So things that maybe um, would be a little bit more safe for beneficial insects like pollinators or honeybees, these are things we're looking at. And there are some new ones out there. So uh, new classes uh, where we see insecticides coming from would be things like the anthernilic diamine. Um, so I believe there are, an, Corteva has a number of these types of products out there potentially like, uh, 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 Chlorantranilaprol, I believe, and there are some others out there. So those are coming. Um, increasingly, we start to see nematicides, and this can be broken down into two categories as well. We've got true nematicides, things like um, Nema Strike or Avicta uh, from Syngenta. Those would be um, true nematicides. And then we've also got things that are called nematostats, where they basically are, are stopping the uh, nematodes from, you know, moving or entering the plant things like that. And that would be more in lines of what like um, Votiva would be. So a broad, broad array, array of these things out there. And then biologicals. So biologicals can be um, very diverse. Anything from 
something that just helps with plant vigor and health or yield. So put a bacteria on the seed and maybe you get a three bushel benefit at the end of the year, that's something. Or we can have biologicals that act as nematicides, insecticides, fungicides. And there are a number of products already out there uh, that do just that. Biologicals will continue to be an increasingly important part of crop protection uh, going forward. I could see it be an area of, of real growth. And finally, inoculants, uh, which we all know in, in soybeans can be important, especially had soybeans not been grown for a period of time. We also see these seeds as being colored. Uh, that's a pretty minor component. And then coatings. This is really hardly ever mentioned, but coatings are such an important part of the seed treatment because why spend the money and the time to put on all these fungicides, insecticides, nematicides if we're not going to use a coating to make sure that active ingredient kind of stays put? And at Bayer, we have a number of, of different coatings, and they're all part of this coating line called uh, peridium or peridium quality uh, seed coatings. And these are typically um, handled, uh, you know, through seed companies or, or those downstream that treat seed at the retail level or, or, or potentially sometimes on, on um, you know, at the co-op level. Um, it's why the seeds are shiny, uh, basically. So, you know, those of us that have been planting corn and soybeans long enough know that, you know, seeds didn't always used to come out looking like uh, uh, gum, uh, gum drops, you know. Uh, now they've got these uh, all these bright colors, and, and this shininess is really provided by these coatings. And what's that? What's that doing is a number of different things. So it's making sure that the active ingredient stays on the seed. It's also helping with flowability, um, you know, in the trading facility um, during the packaging process, and also in the field, going from a planter box, um, you know, uh, through the planter or through the tender. These are going to be areas that are going to be improved through the use of. Um, these peridium coatings. Also, the plantability is going to be improved. It's going to reduce dust off, so it's going to reduce abrasion. Uh, so these seeds are going to slide, you know, through the planter and against each other in a way that doesn't produce as much dust, which is important. We don't want the neonicotinoids to be um, sloughed off and, and gone through planter exhaust or uh, otherwise lost to the environment. We need them where we want them, kind of in the plant. Um, and again, these things are going to be you know, safe to use for the seed, and they're highly compatible with all the seed treatment products that are out there. So um, I don't have much more on coatings other than just to mention this. Um, you know, they, they really are, um, you know, a, a common commonly used thing. Probably people don't appreciate them uh, for what they do, uh, but they are out there uh, working towards sustainability uh, for us. One of the things um, that I have kind of mentioned here as we've gone through is this idea of dust off. So any of us that have ever um, operated a planter, especially a vacuum planter, um, you know, know just how dusty uh, this can be. And, and part of the reason for this is because to, to move seeds through the planter, you know, all of these planter manufacturers are going to um, require or at least recommend that some sort of seed lubricant uh, or, you know, dry lubricant is used, okay? So these are going to be things like talc, graphite, talc, graphite combinations, okay? And you can see here as we rev up this uh, planter, we see all the kind of talc dust that's coming off of it. And this is really what we're trying to avoid through um, newer, better fluency agents, okay? And I'm going to talk about one specifically from Bayer. Um, Oh, generally because, you know, this is the product I'm most familiar with, I fully recognize that there are other fluency agent products out there, and um, I'm sure that, um, you know, they all perform um, to, with some level of satisfaction. I can really only talk about uh, the fluency agent from Bayer uh, because I'm most familiar with it. So um, our product that we have currently on the marketplace for this is called Fluency Agent Advanced. And so unlike talc or graphite, um, really what this is, is a 100% polyethylene wax, okay? And so um, because we're using a wax-based product to, uh, as our fluency agent, we're able to perform the same level of, you know, singulation, plantability, flowability, but with much less dust off. And so because of that, we have a lot, um, a reduced risk of having um, active ingredients be spread out into the landscape where we don't want them. So, so what is this product? Really, it's a seed lubricant um, for corn and soybeans. Um, it would be applied at the time of planting, could potentially be applied um, upstream, uh, upstream as the seeds are treated, but not many companies do that. Uh, it's typically something that's applied at planting time. Um, 
it's going to reduce the amount of dust significantly compared to tau graphite or tau graphite combinations. And so, of course, this is going to improve um, the level of risk that are experienced by pollinators that could potentially be in the landscape. This would include honeybees as well as native uh, wild pollinators. And we had originally launched this product in 2014, uh, and it was called Fluency Agent. And we've done a lot of testing, made some improvements in the formulation that I'll talk about here in, in a few slides. And so that's why we've got this current product, Fluency Agent Advance. It was launched in 2017, um, and it's currently available uh, for use. So uh, what do I mean when I'm talking about dust off? So there's a number of ways that you can measure this, and I'll, I'll show us a few graphs later, but really simply, um, one of the simplest ways to kind of uh, look at what's going on here is just to do a drop test. So for example, in this situation, I can't remember the height here. It was either one foot or one meter. You're taking some volume of each of these seed lubricants and you're dropping them from that height. And you can see they're dropping them here on cardboard and surrounded by cardboard so we can see really nicely the cloud of dust that comes off. So if you look at the top right here with talc, you can see that as that talc you know, hits the potential for dust, so this would happen anytime it's moving around the plant or things like that, it's really going to explode off and, and really um, cause a lot of dust to move. And anytime We've got, you know, neonicotinoids in that seed being treated. That's a lot of potential for movement off target. Uh, same thing would be true with the talc graphite combination. You can see here there's a lot of dust that kind of pops up, perhaps less so than talc. Um, but when you do the same thing with fluency agent, you really hardly see any dust come off at all. It just kind of drops down and then stays. And so that really speaks to the nature of the, uh, the wax-based product here that we have as well as the potential for reducing dust off. So that's very simply, this is kind of what we see with this product. Now, I'll show you some graphs here, um, and hopefully you don't get overwhelmed with this, but essentially what we're looking at here on the left would be the uh, original fluency agent uh, that we had launched in 2014 compared to talc, okay, um, as well as no lubricant whatsoever. And what we're measuring here in green is the total amount of dust that comes off, and then in blue would be the amount of clothianidin dust, which is what we uh, did this test with. And these are basically we're using a stand and a, and a planter, um, you know, unit to kind of measure how much dust is coming off as it's being planted. So this is kind of a very carefully measured laboratory type test. And you can see that when talc is used compared to no lubricant, significantly more dust is coming off of that in that planter exhaust. But when we use fluency agent in advance, compared to talc, we see that there's a huge drop in the amount of dust that comes off. Even when no lubricant is used, we see about a 50% drop in total dust um, that we see come off of there, which is good. We want to see a lot of dust um, being reduced. More importantly, perhaps, is looking at these blue bars, these fluency, or the, I'm sorry, this clothianidin dust, because that's the active that we want to keep on those seeds. When we use talc or no lubricant at all, we get about 0.21 grams per 100,000 seeds coming off. We cut that by over half when we use fluency agent. So much, uh, you know, 50% or more less dust is coming off um, when we're using fluency agent. Now, this new product that we've got, fluency agent advanced, which replaces the original fluency agent in the marketplace, we see, uh, you know, a significant amount of reduction, or a significantly lower uh, amount of dust coming off. We're dropping from 0.37 grams down to 0.28 grams. And then we also see a, re a further reduction in the amount of clothianid in there. The, the reduction is, is small numerically, but any gains we can get in um, dust reduction are going to mean uh, fewer risk and, and lower impact on pollinators that are out there. But so the dust reduction is kind of a side benefit. It has to do the job of being a, a seed lubricant first, right? So when we look at uh, on this graph, we're really looking at Singulation through the planter, skips, and multiples in red. Okay, so you know, so when we use no lubricant, um, we can see that um, singulation is improved through the use of talc. Uh, skips are reduced. Uh, multiples were not reduced in this test. Um, when we use fluency agent, we see a little bit better singulation. We see a little bit fewer skips and about the same number of multiples. So. Again, it's working as well as talc is, if not better, and, and that is a relief that in addition to doing the reduced, um, the dust reduction that we want, 
it's also performing the job of a, of a fantastic seed lubricant. And again, with Fluency Agent Advanced, which again is the new product that is replacing Fluency Agent, similar levels of singulation um, and then also uh, skips and multiples. So again, really excited that it's doing both the jobs of dust reduction as well as um, uh, planter lubrication. When you're, when you're looking at other um, seed lubricants that are out there, so I'm not gonna be able to talk about all of them from other companies, um, these are going to be things that you're going to look for. You're going to look for, are, is there a potential for dust reduction? Because that's really what we're after. Um, and then making sure that the singulation is there and, and all of these sorts of things. So those are just things to keep an eye out uh, for. Um, there's some other benefits associated with uh, Fluency Agent. Um, so, for example, we've all cleaned out uh, planter boxes uh, following planting after using talc or graphite. And we know how kind of uh, messy those can be. Fluency Agent, um, because of its wax-based nature, it's going to leave a much cleaner um, planter. The, the cleanup is going to be much less um, compared to using something like a talc or graphite. And that's just because there's a lot less dust buildup uh, in those. You take a look at these vacuum meter housings. Uh, so, for example, over here with the Case IH, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, kind of refugee uh, dust and graphite built up on, the, on this planter housing here. When you look at the one where we've tested with fluency agent, it looks very clean. There's hardly any buildup whatsoever. So cleanup is a minimal uh, with fluency agent advanced. Um, so the difference, the primary difference between the old product that we launched in 2014 and the new product uh, that came out in 2017 is really surrounding uh, user handling. So it's a very low use rate. Um, it's really only one eighth of a cup per seed unit. And, um, because of that, we wanted to make sure that we had the best handling characteristics that we could. So the original Fluency Agent Advance worked and worked well, but there were some clumping issues you know, during the metering out process. Uh, we see a lot less of that with Fluency Agent Advance. Um, it's you know, easier to mix and pour. It's not sticking on, on the surface of the spoon, anything like that. So really the, the improvements that were made uh, were not anything that um, you know, couldn't have been, uh, you know, you could have worked with original fluency agent, but we really wanted to make the experience better uh, for the grower and those that are applying this product, you know, in field. Uh, when you're planting, we all know uh, every second counts, and so we wanted to make sure that product was, uh, you know, improved. So, um, so just to kind of quickly summarize fluency agent. So really, it's the whole point of this. It's a stewardship type of product. Okay, so we're really reducing the amount of dust. Um, we want as good of flowability through the planter as talc and graphite, uh, and if we can improve on that, better. And we do see some small but significant improvement. Uh, we want easier cleanup, you know. There's no need to be done planting a field, um, you know, at 10 p.m. and then have to do cleanup for the next day, not get to bed until midnight. Fluency Agent Advance is gonna be able to make sure, you know, your planter stays a lot cleaner than it would otherwise. Um, and, and we've tested this with all makes and types of planters, and, and it's a very low use rate. So it's only one eighth uh, cut per seed unit that, that this is uh, you know being used. And you know you just want to make sure to not go over that. Uh, when you start to get too much of this stuff, it can uh, cause issues. But you really want to stay at or you know at that use rate um, and make sure that it's mixed in uh, properly. So, um, so. Just real quickly, uh, you know, anytime you launch a new product, you want to see how it compares to the old one. Um, you know, so we did a, a big field testing of this product um, in 2016. Uh, a lot of this went through the Illinois Corn Growers Association, I believe, and so we sent out surveys and asked for how do you think the new product worked compared to the old one. You know, almost 90% said that they thought it was as good or better than the original. Um, they mentioned improved measuring, pouring, and mixing, and less residue in the seed opera. So that's fantastic. 100% um, thought that it was equal to or better in, in terms of planter um, plate disc buildup, so doing a great job there continually. Um, also, you know, wear and tear on the planter, disc plate, other things like that. Again, 100% of users thought it did as good or better. Um, and then, you know, close to 95 here said that it was equal to um, the original uh, fluency agent in terms of residue in and around the planter. So those are all marks that we wanted to hit. Um, so that kind of concludes my um, review of, of polymers, fluency agents, seed treatments, and bees. I did want to give some what I think are pretty cool resources that you can reach out to. So um, right here, this is the website, and this is kind of what the website looks like. 
for um, the Crop Life America Seed Treatment Stewardship Guide. So if you are anyone that is working with um, seed treatments or, or things like that, and you work with potentially growers and farmers or even applicators or are doing presentations surrounding pollinators, you know, talking to people about bees, this is a fantastic website for getting a lot more information and it's really ready to go. I mean, you can go on here and download uh, a couple of these, uh, you know, uh, documents and really read through them and, you know, help advocate for uh, seed treatments um, should you want to do that. Um, and the other one I wanted to mention was this website right here. This is the Bear Bee Care uh, website. So there is constantly new information being put on here by the those um, entomologists that within Bear that work with bees. They're collecting information that's going on in academic research. They're doing some of their own research. Um, you know, talking about bees, bee health, pollinator safety, and they're putting all that information on here. So it's a great landing page, again, beecare.bear.com, and it's a great resource, especially if you ever work with um, kids or give presentations to uh, schools, really a lot of great uh, resources on here. So um, I hope that that was a, a good presentation. I hope you got out of it what you thought you might. Um, I will uh, just kind of, if you go back to the first slide, um, you know, you on the recording, you'll be able to see my email. It's nick.tinsley at bear.com. And I would be happy to take questions now. And if you have a question you think of later on, feel free to send me back an email. So um, I guess, Jill, if there are any questions, uh, be happy to get to them. Yeah, that was a thank you for the presentation, Nick. That was excellent. Um, we do have a few questions. Uh, so first off, um, will the seed industry have an insecticide that is not in the neonic class in the near future? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, um, so neonics have been kind of being used for quite some time now, still very effective um, and, and still very useful. But we are always looking to bring new products to marketplace, new different classes, you know, so that we can potentially rotate chemistries or even provide mixtures that would help with resistance management. So the key class that's being probably that's most close to commercialization, in fact, has been commercialized in Canada and in the U.S. and other crops are the anthranilic diamine. Um, these have... Um, their spectrum of activity, they tend to be uh, uh, maybe a little bit better on lepidopterans or worms. Um, and they also take care of some of the insects that neonics do. Um, but the spectrum of activity isn't quite 100% overlapping. So that's one to, to watch out. Um, the other thing that I'm excited about is the potential for biologic based insecticides. Okay. So, you know, in, in the corn world, we use, uh, you know, biologic um, Lee rooted uh, insecticides in BT corn. I think that going forward in seed treatments, we're going to continue to look for and develop biologics, not only for a yield um, benefit, but for a potentially insecticidal activity, nematicidal activity, and et cetera. So great question. Great. Uh, you talked about biologics and inoculants. What's the difference between the two? Yeah, so, so I guess Strictly speaking, there might not be a difference between the two. I think you can think of inoculants as a subgroup of a bryologic. So when I think of inoculants and soybeans specifically, I think of um, Brady rhizobium japonicum. Okay, so this is that bacteria that forms that symbiosis with the roots of soybean plants to help it produce nitrogen. Um, so that is a biologic organism. So you can call it an inoculant, um, specifically you know, for soybean there, a subgroup of biologic. Um, Biologics really is just a general term for anything that um, is, is used as a product, but has its roots in um, a, another living organism. So you can have heat killed, uh, you know, bacteria put on the seed, that would be a biologic, or you could have a living bacteria um, put on a seed that would be a biologic as well. So a huge variety, yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, another question here: Can there be, or can there be an issue with the intake of dusty air by vacuum planters that causes the loss of seed treatment through abrasion? Okay, so yeah, intake of dust in the uh, the intake of the vacuum meter, and then dust running through the planter abrading the seed. Yes, so that seems to me like I, I've seen presentations on this. Um, 
I would think that anytime you've got, um, you know, uh, air that is potentially uh, has particles of, of dust or, or sand or dirt in it, um, running across the seeds, you could potentially have abrasion and that would be an issue. As I recall, there's an individual, Art Shasma, uh, he's an academic, uh, he works in uh, Canada at the University of Guelph. I think he's done some work on um, intake filters that can, uh, you know, help reduce some of that. I don't know how far that work is uh, as far as being like a commercial product, but certainly uh, that sounds like something that could potentially be an issue, yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, we have one more question. If anyone has uh, questions that they have for Nick, please submit those and we can answer those. But um, one right here, what do you think about the microbial seed treatments that we can add now? Um, examples include quick roots, optimized, tack team. Yeah, so it's an interesting question. Um, full disclosure, right, I work for Bayer and those products are um, part of the legacy Monsanto, Monsanto Acceleron Seed Applied Solution. So um, those are now, uh, you know, within the bare portfolio of products. I will say that I have not had very much experience with those. So I'm from the legacy bear side. And so I worked more with things like, you know, gaucho and uh, things like that. But what I do know is that um, my microbial type products um, carry a lot of potential um, for improving uh, plant health and potentially yield. Um, it's one of these situations where, um, depending on the field, it, it might provide a benefit um, you know, under certain circumstances, maybe it won't. I, I'm just not very familiar with those specific products to understand how exactly they work and when they would provide a benefit or not. Um, but I will say that uh, should you have a question about those types of products, uh, there are uh, Acceleron Seed Applied Solutions people out there that are much more experienced with it and could probably give you a more satisfactory type of answer. Um, my experience with, with biologics in general, um, so we, we're constantly evaluating new biological seed treatments every year as part of my job. And one of the things I'll find is when I put these on as a seed treatment, um, some, you know, it'll be frustrating because I'll put out 20 locations and maybe uh, I'll get you know, a, a two bushel benefit on average, um, but I'll have some sites that do really well and some sites, sites that do really low. And it's hard for me to understand uh, what factors are playing a role in making these biologics work or not. It's just a really young field and we don't know as much about it as we, uh, as we probably would like to. So a great question. Awesome. Uh, can you talk a little about, um, is there a more efficient or uniform method of applying the product? And I'm thinking they're talking about the fluency agent product. Sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, kind of the standard way would be to order these uh, buckets and they do come in, you know, cartons uh, of four buckets and each bucket treats, I can't remember how many um, units of seed. And so you get this scoop and you mix it in. Okay, so that's standard. But there are other ways that it can be applied. So I mentioned that um, in some cases it could potentially be applied upstream during the treating process. So that's one way it could be applied. Um, uh, but maybe more, along the lines of this audience, there are powder feeders on seed tenders that are out there that can apply things like inoculants and some of these other, you know, type of quick root type things, I, I believe, you know, any, any of these like things that are seed treatments, but they're planter box type applications. So there are powder feeders out there that can work with this product. Um, you have to kind of make sure that the manufacturer uh, of the, of the, um, you know, the, the dry applicator that's going on there it is compatible with fluency agent. It's related to the angle and how it flows in, but certainly um, if, if that's a specific question one of you had, send, send me an email, nick.tinsley at bear.com, and I'd be happy to set you up with somebody who can uh, figure that out. So yeah, great question. Fun. Well, I don't, uh, there aren't any other questions coming in, um, but I want to thank you, Nick, for coming on today and sharing your um, presentation with us. Uh, it was very excellent. If um, anyone has questions, uh, your email again is nick.tinsley at bear.com, correct? Yep, correct. Easy as it is. Shoot you a question that way. 
Um, that concludes uh, today's presentation. This uh, webinar will be posted to the ILSOI Advisor website within the next week, and you can um, catch more about the presentation there. Thank you for joining us today. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.